Hey guys, I want to do a video on the Byzantine Empire, specifically looking at Byzantine art like this. Why did the Byzantine Empire, why did the art within this time frame, why did all these murals show iconography of saints with halos and angels with halos? Now, our history books will tell you that the Byzantine Empire occurred after the fall of Rome, lasted for a thousand years, until taken over by the Ottoman Empire in 1453. They will tell you that the reason that we see so much art that they label during the Dark Ages, like this, and this, and this, and this, is because of the religious fervor at that time and this iconography the symbology of the halos around people's heads were basically showing how righteous and pious these people were at that time that's what our history books tell you and again our history books tell you that the byzantine empire lasted for a millennium after the fall of the roman empire but ending with the Ottoman conquest in 1453. And you can keep going. People also ask, did the Byzantine Empire last a thousand years? It survived for a thousand years. They even use the word millennium. So you see how in Satan's Little Season, the history books have been rewritten. Time has been added so that they have more time to place these events within. And so the Dark Ages that they say occurred from roughly 500 to 1500 AD. Basically, that's because they've added hundreds of years to our chronology. But the Dark Ages were actually the time of light. And that the Byzantine Empire occurred, I agree, it did occur after the fall of Rome because the Millennial Kingdom began after the destruction of Jerusalem and fall of Rome when the stone crushed the feet of iron, the Roman Empire, and miry clay, Jerusalem. And then that stone became a large mountain and went throughout the earth. That is showing the Millennial Kingdom. The history books hide it and tell you it's the Byzantine Empire within the Dark Ages, but it was the Millennial Kingdom of Christ during the Age of Light. And not only saints, but angels. And we see in the Bible, especially in 1 Thessalonians, the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. This is what occurred at his second coming. That occurred within the time frame after the destruction of Jerusalem when God judged the heathen nation, the beast Roman Empire who had previously judged Israel in Jerusalem. God brought his wrath upon that kingdom, just like he said, and set up this thousand year reign, just like he said. If we look in the book of Revelation, these are the people that I believe we are seeing in this Byzantine, quote, Byzantine art. In Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither have received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. These are the people that I believe 
were ruling and reigning with the angels for a thousand years that are described in Revelation 20. And we see several verses about light emanating from saints and angels and Jesus but it's not talked about that much in the church. But going to Daniel 12, speaking of this time that we were just discussing about the destruction of Jerusalem and fall of Rome, it says in verse 1 of Daniel 12, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I believe this is the kings and priests that were ruling and reigning, part of the first resurrection of Jesus Christ, that were placed in positions of prominence in his millennial kingdom. Here's another picture of Byzantine art. This is a mural of the Byzantine emperor Justinian. And Justinian means upright or just or righteous. And you can see the halo emanating from his head, from his body. And if you look at Byzantine art, and historians have showed this, that all the Byzantine, quote, emperors were depicted having halos emanating light from them. And so my thoughts are, you know, Justinian, was he a glorified saint that was part of the first resurrection that was placed in power within the millennial kingdom of Christ? Another example is Constantine the Great, who our history books will tell you began Christianity after the fall of Rome, and this when it really was established. Again, you see Constantine the Great depicted with halos around him constantly in Byzantine art. Was Constantine the Great, Constantine meaning constant, are steadfast, just like Jesus said for the churches to be, were Constantine and Justinian glorified saints that were part of the first resurrection that were given prominent roles within the kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ. You see... Um, what's the name of this? The Hara Sophia. And this is in Istanbul, formerly known as Constantinople. And this was built in what the history books will tell you, 537 AD. This is an old world building. This was built during the millennial kingdom of Christ. And it possibly was built by Constantine himself with the help of other glorified saints and angels. And he may have ruled that area or ministered that area from this very place. But this place stood as part of the Eastern Roman Empire and was used for that purpose for several hundred years. And they'll tell you in the history books that it went through the hands of the Catholic Church, then it was regained by the Eastern Roman Empire, 
Ethan Eastern Orthodox Church until uh, the fall of the Byzantine Empire when it um, exchanged hands with the Ottoman Empire. And so you can see the inside of Hira Sophia and you can see the Arabic you can see the beautiful beautiful ceilings the columns you know obviously this reminds us of all the previous old world buildings that we've looked at over and over within this study uh, with the dome uh, roofs um, you know but what if before this fell into the hands of the Ottoman Empire did it look something like this the 16th chapel with all the murals and you can see that it's been painted over at the least you can see things have been scrubbed out and obviously Arabic language has been added to it uh, from the time that the Ottoman Empire gained control over this um, from the Byzantine Empire I think that basically this was part of the Millennial Kingdom of Christ used for the purpose of forwarding the Gospel of Jesus Christ and that at the end of the thousand year reign it was simply usurped by others and changed and we see this over and over again. We see this in the Vatican City. We see it here. We see it all over the world. But again, this is the 16th chapel in the Vatican City. And you can see all the murals of angels and saints emanating light. And again, you know, getting back to scripture, we see when Moses came down from Mount Sinai in Exodus 34, starting at verse 29, and it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. And they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses taught with them. And afterward all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. So basically, Moses' face shone like this. This is what the children of Israel saw. The same thing that we see depicted in Byzantine art. And we not only see this in the Old Testament, but we see it in the New Testament. When Stephen is in Acts 6, Stephen, starting in verse 8, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. He was spirit-filled. Then they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and called him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him and saw his face at as it had been the face of an angel. 
the face of an angel is a face that emanates light. And I think the reason that Stephen was emanating light because he was so spirit filled and he actually was with a close proximity to the presence of the Lord as we see when he stoned in the next chapter in chapter 7 starting at verse 53 when they heard these things they were cut to the heart or verse 54 and they gnashed on him with their teeth but he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God the veil of heavens were opened up for Stephen, whose face shone, emanated light like an angel, saw Jesus stand on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is a time that the Holy Spirit was resting upon Stephen and that during this particular time, his face shone like an angel. He was within the presence of the Lord with the heavens open. We see this in Matthew at the transfiguration with Jesus. And after six days, this is Matthew 17, Verse 1 and 2, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And this reminds me of 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is the results of a glorified body within the presence of the Lord, and having light emanating from these saints and from these angels. You know, and our body has enough energy to light a hundred watt light bulb. And there's actually several studies that have shown that we actually emanate visible light from this corruptible body. There's several studies that have shown that. Um, you know, it's just a thousand times um, lower than what the visible naked eye can see. Um, you know, we're in this corruptible flesh, but with glorified body, that changes. And that's something that we have to look forward to at the res resurrection of the last day as believers in Jesus Christ. We will, too, be part of the resurrection. It'll be the resurrection of the last day when Jesus returns, coming for his saints with his kingdom, heavenly Jerusalem, where he is right now. But just continuing this, again, there's more Byzantine art. This is of the archangel Michael, again, with the halo the wings. Here's the 16th chapel that our history books will tell you the ceiling was painted by Michael Angelo. Was the ceiling actually painted by a mortal human or was it painted by the archangel Michael? Michael the angel. Here is the palace of Versailles in France. And this, I think, is the Hall of Mirrors. But look at how beautiful this old world building is. This is something that we cannot build today. This is Millennial Kingdom of Christ buildings. The murals on them. And you can see the murals here. And again, it depicts 
and Jellet Beans, just like the Sixteen Chapel, which may or may not have been painted by the Archangel Michael during this time period of the Millennial Kingdom of Christ. So, this brings me to my final thought about all this. And what if you had glorified saints filled with the Holy Spirit, with power, showing their glory within the presence of the Lord, and you had them all under one roof? How much energy would we have contained within that church or cathedral? like this one, St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow, that the history books will tell you was built in the 1500s, but this is an old world building that was repurposed, painted over during Satan's little season. But what if this cathedral with the spires, the domes, was an energy storing unit you know, cathedral derives its name from cathode, which is part of the a battery, basically, an energy storing unit. And the cathode specifically, I think, um, discharges the energy of the battery. But what if you had glorified saints and angels with this much energy of light, Within a cathedral like this, an energy storing unit, is that how, during the Millennial Kingdom, cities were supplied of energy? Was it not only maybe from uh, the firmament or ether, is what some people uh, postulate, but was it actually from those that were part of the millennial kingdom of Christ that were within these cathedrals, these places of worship was enough energy produced to actually emanate from these energy storing units into the surrounding areas. And that brings me to my last point. And again, you know, just look at a few verses now in the New Testament where it speaks of light, you know, um, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Well, in Ephesians 5, 13 and 14, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepeth and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. Colossians 1, 12, giving thanks unto the father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5, Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. So read some of these verses now that we've kind of looked at Byzantine art and what may have been ruling and reigning with Christ, the glorified saints and angels who had light emanating them, emanating from them, and it brings a whole new light to those passages that I just read. But getting back finally to this thought, and I want others to maybe think about this more. I don't have a great physics mind. I'm more biology, chemistry. That's what I did uh, during med school and um, throughout residency. I did not like physics that much. So um, I know just enough about it to kind of understand when somebody else talks about it, but I can't explain it. But if others could maybe try to come to conclusions as this hypothesis of the actual glorified saints and angels within the millennial kingdom who could be gathered together in cathedrals like this, could this possibly be 
a source, if not the source, besides obviously Jesus our Lord, of the millennial kingdom at that time. And, you know, finally, just full circle, if you look at a map of Tartary in Russia and, you know, Tartarian architecture, I think has been mislabeled. I think it's Millennial Kingdom of Christ architecture that was in the region of Tartary at that time. But look at some old maps. And, you know, I love maps like this. I've shown maps like this before. This is the Great Wall of China, dividing China from Tartary. This is now in the middle of China because China has gained this area of land that was formerly known as the Great Tartarian Empire. But that's why you have the Wall of China in the middle of China. Our history books don't want to tell you any of this. If you go here, for instance, you can see, and I can't really read Latin, but I know this from seeing this in another um, English translation. This is Tinduk, and this is where Christians uh, settled in, is this 290 years or 1290? Is this uh, 290 years within the Millennial Kingdom or is this 1290? You be the judge. You can see Gog here, um, but there's several great things on this map. I wish I could read Latin, um, but finally I want to show you this. Look at these buildings here, and you can see them scattered. If I can, that may be as far as I can blow it up, but you can see here a it looks like a, a, a cathedral with a spire. You can see the same here, you see them all over the map. You see all these cathedrals throughout the land of Tartary, and even into other areas but throughout this map you see all these and oftentimes they're placed by what looks like names of cities sometimes not but my thought is is this a map of Tartary during the Millennial Kingdom of Christ and are these buildings shown on this map because these are places of energy are these power centers and if you link them together is it showing us a power grid of the tartarian empire and if you look at russia today and just go to the different cathedrals within russia i just found this 10 of russia's most beautiful churches you'll see structures like this with spires and domes and this with spires and domes and this small ones like this medium sized ones getting a little larger but in areas why would you build this right there overlooking a cliff well i think that this here may have been one of these cathedrals on the map that was showing that it was a place of energy and did glorified saints and possibly even angels come to these places to worship with music and I can only imagine um, the praise music that went on at that time in these cathedrals. But did that produce energy throughout this countryside? And is that why it's positioned where it is? You see another uh, Church of the Sign of Our Lady in the Moscow region. You can see what looks like some old world architecture next to it. That definitely is. You see the same thing over and over throughout 
all of Russia. And this is only a few examples. The Kassan Cathedral in St. Petersburg. You know, that was something right out of Vatican City. St. Isaac's Cathedral. Again, you see some of them larger, some of them smaller. And finally back to St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow. But are these cathedrals peppered throughout Russia? Were these Millennial Kingdom buildings used as energy storage units that receive their energy from glorified saints within them. So that's something I hope others that have a better physics mind than me can explore further, and I'll close with that. God bless.